I'll always remember the start of September and the rainy day that it ended. I hope this reminds you of a wahoo chilling under a palm tree. Oh, Hannah, just me and my family. Well, what's up, you guys? Uh, it's the Andrew Christopher Show, a.k.a. The AC Show. I am your host, Andrew Christopher. Um, doing a bit of a different episode um, this week. I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, my daughter, Lily Jean. Um, many of you know, maybe some of you don't, and I've found that the more and more people I'm meeting recently uh, don't know about my daughter, Lily. She um, She passed away when she was not quite three years old and uh, she had brain cancer. Um, So I really wanted to tell a bit of her story and celebrate her life and uh, fill some of you guys in on on what's really shaped me as a person, Um, but mainly focusing on her and her time here on this earth. And it kind of came up, I I met some friends of a friend's uh, at our daughter's dance class. My daughter Haven is dancing. And so I met these people and we were kind of just reintroducing ourselves and, and doing the small talk stuff. And, uh, it's, um, I think a lot of bereaved parents will relate to sometimes having awkward conversations about how many kids you have, or, um, you know, the question just came up and said, yeah, how many kids, how old are your kids? And so I said, Jaden's 10 and Haven's five. And, um, for this time, I left it at that. Uh, I feel like it's kind of 50-50 whether I, I bring up Lily or not in conversations in that way. And there's so many emotions that come from that uh, <laughs> for myself. Um, you know, when I when I do talk about her and mention, say, yeah, we've got a 10-year-old, a 5-year-old, um, we've got a kid on the way, and uh, also had a daughter who passed away <laughs> when she was two and a half. Um, and people's jaws drop and they don't know what to do and I don't know what to do. So I usually have a dumb smile on my face kind of like this. And, and then I start thinking, oh my God, am I really almost half smirking? I just told these people that, that I, I had a daughter who passed away and they're probably thinking I'm insane. And so a lot of things go through your head and that's why half the time I don't really bring it up. But then if I don't bring it up, I feel even worse. And um, cause it's, you know, I, I never want Lily to be forgotten, but part of it is I don't want to put these people in a position. Some people start crying and I'm like, ah, we're at the kid's dance class. I don't want you to start crying. Um, and again, then that other feeling of, wow, I just told these people I had a kid who passed away. Should I be crying? But realistically, if I cried every time I talked or thought about Lily Jean, then half the day I'd have a fricking puddle of tears surrounding me. So that's not the best way to go about it. Um, so I didn't mention Lily Jean in this, uh, situation. Um, I'm sure she'll come up at a later date as we get closer with these friends, or maybe they're watching and, and, uh, hearing about Lily, or maybe they had already heard about her. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of a small glimpse into the head of a bereaved parent when, when they get asked, how many kids do you have? And I don't know. I'm sure uh, everybody deals with it differently or answers that question differently. For me, like I said, sometimes I, I bring her up. It's very situation dependent because um, it is obviously a very sad uh, topic to bring up. And so sometimes I'll mention it. Sometimes I won't. And um, I think that's okay. It's my way of, of dealing with it. And and I know that eventually her story will come up. And that's and I think it pushed me. And I was like, fuck, I should have brought it up that time. <laughs> like, these guys were really nice people. I could tell they were very compassionate and, and would really, really care. And um, so I think that pushed me to do this episode. I knew I was going to do this at some point. Um, I didn't know when. And I had been having a pretty rough couple weeks. And then that little... Uh, interaction I think pushed me to say okay I think it's time to tell Lily's story and I've never really I've I've talked to people about it but I think I'm going to go into a bit more detail here and uh, hopefully you guys are interested and it's um, my way of 
hopefully raising some more awareness about pediatric cancer and, as I said, celebrating her life, making sure her story's out there for whoever wants to know about it. Um, and I know my family and friends who did know Lily will, will really enjoy kind of a recap of her life and, and uh, they can watch or listen and see all the pictures I'll put up and, and think of their own memories. And um, Sorry if you cry. If I start to cry, I'll just put a picture up right here and then nobody will see it. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I guess we'll get right into it. Uh, Lily was born December 5th, 2010. Um, one of my first memories is uh, a local church in Chilliwack um, sent us over a, like a, a hamper, a Christmas hamper full of food and, uh, and presents Um and that was just really nice. I, it's a nice memory I have because obviously it was pretty crazy. So we didn't have a lot of time to get out and, and do the shopping and stuff at that time with our first kid. And they probably knew we were two young parents who didn't really know what we were doing. So they wanted to help us out. So that was really great. Um, and uh, then, you know, I went back to work. I was working at Pathways, working with disabled adults at the time and um, kind of living our normal lives. Uh, Lily's mom, Chelsea, was home with her. And then I guess the first question we always, or not the first one, but it often comes up and people were, would ask, you know, how did you know something was wrong? Um, and as sick as it sounds, um, Lily was having a hard time sitting up straight and holding her head up and she would often slouch. And it turns out it was because of this tumor that was inside her head and she was having a hard time holding up her head with all this extra weight. And so we just kind of saw her not sitting up straight and having a hard time with her head. Um, so we decided to take her to a walk-in clinic um, in October when she was 10 months old. And the doctor there saw us and he, um, he wanted us to go to the hospital to get an ultrasound. But at that time, the ultrasound technician had already gone home. So we had to wait and we were going to go in the morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, that night it kind of went zero to 60 and she wouldn't sleep at all. Um, Lily was so restless and uh, she would only sleep if we were holding her and then it would be, you know, maybe 20 minutes and she was up screaming again. Um, and I guess this pressure was building up inside her head. So... We went to the hospital the next morning and got the ultrasound um, and uh, really kind of weird um, coincidence. I knew the ultrasound technician um, from around Chilliwack. It's a small town and and a friend of a friend kind of thing. And um, she kind of didn't seem in the greatest mood. And in hindsight, I think she kind of knew something was was wrong. Um, but obviously is not allowed to tell us. Uh, she needs to wait for the doctor to review the, the scan. And so um, we, we went to the waiting room or somewhere in the pediatric ward at Chilliwack Hospital, and they came and talked to us. And um, from there, we were rushed off to Children's Hospital in Vancouver. And when we got there, within an hour or two, um, they were opening Lily's head up and, uh, to relieve all this pressure that was going in to drain some of the fluid, I think that had built up and grab a small chunk, uh, to do a biopsy cause they knew there was a tumor in there. Um, and so they did this, it was a pretty crazy day. Um, obviously, uh, you know, brain surgery on a 10 month old baby is not normal. Um, and so we were just in shock and kind of in survival mode at that time, doing, going just autopilot, kind of wanting to know what's wrong with our kid. And, and it's kind of a blur those first, first few days. And so she came out of surgery, um, just laying there, big cut open on her head. And uh, we um, had to wait a few days, probably yeah, like a week, um, for the results. And, uh, so that was October 11th is when she had the ultrasound and, 
and first surgery. And then the 21st, I guess I have some notes. You'll see me looking down a lot. Um, she, uh, we got the diagnosis, um, that it was glioblastoma GBM, which is a brain cancer. Um, the same brain cancer that Gord Downey of the tragically hip, um, recently passed away from. And, uh, this is very rare for kids to get this type of cancer. Um, and, uh, they have no idea when it started, if she was born with it or if it was something that started growing after, but it grows very quickly. Um, so they kind of assumed it was something that just showed up and then started growing. And that's where all this pressure and fluid started collecting. So it was cancer. We knew that, um, Lily's mom and I had to go sit in a room with, with, um, with the doctor and, and talk about decisions on what we could do. And it was one of the, I mean, just craziest things to ever happen and biggest decisions of our lives that we had to make. Um, as the doctor told us that doing nothing would be a very viable option at this stage with how aggressive, um, this cancer is and how low of a probability of survival is, um, pretty much next to zero. And, uh, in the long term, it was, you know, it was kind of always going to end, um, badly for Lily Jean. And, um, I think the more we talked about it with the doctor and, um, it was, uh, it was that, you know, there's a chance we could get her to live longer. Um, still, he urged us not to think of it as <laughs> there's a chance that, you know, she'll survive or whatever. It was, um, it was more that we could get her some more time with us and, and, and then maybe see. But he uh, didn't really give us much hope <laughs> in terms of survival. And that was something I think, um, well, for myself, I kind of created in my own mind was the hope and because of course you, you need to have something to hang on to going through that kind of thing. Um, but again, very aggressive, um, incurable brain tumor. And so we had to make the decision, were we going to let this thing play its course or were we going to start with another brain surgery to remove as much as we could um, and then intense chemotherapy to try and shrink it and stop the growth. And so we obviously chose to, to fight it, which I would always, um, choose again. And, uh, you know, it got us another year and a half of, of time with almost two years with, with Lily, where we did a lot of stuff. So it was, it was the right decision for sure. Um, so after that, it went to, as I said, another, uh, brain surgery, to remove as much as they could. They, they came to us with some numbers and then changed the numbers a bit throughout the course of treatment, not being sure how much of the tumor they were actually able to get out. I think ballpark, it was somewhere around 30 to 40% that they actually got removed, uh, with the surgery and looking into the future, it did cause, um, quite a bit of harm to the right side of her body where she couldn't, uh, use her right arm as much. It was very weak. Uh, same with her walking or running. She was, um, her right leg was not working as well as the left side. And, um, so it already had some, some effects on her. Uh, and so after that surgery, we were in hospital, um, recovering, uh, for quite a while. And we had our first Halloween there and, um, we dressed up as pirates. And they did a great job at the hospital of having candy and the kids would go around to the different rooms trick-or-treating. Lily wasn't doing so well, so we kind of missed the parade. All the kids got together and did a parade around the hospital. Um, so we missed that, but we still got dressed up afterwards and, and everyone was really good about having her come over and giving her candy. Even though, I mean, she was 10, well, I guess 11 months at this time. Um, and anyway, so that was kind of our first interesting hospital experience we never thought we would be a part of, was having Halloween in a hospital. Um, and then it, uh, 
came time for her first birthday in December. And at this time, I'm, we had started chemotherapy, so we were in there seeing how she was going to react and, and uh, um, still sleeping at the hospital and at uh, like Ronald McDonald House, or they were setting us up at a, at a hotel close by. Um, so one of us would go stay there, one of us would stay with Lily. And uh, her first birthday we had at the playroom um, at BC Children's Hospital and all our friends and family came out. Um, it was cool to get everybody together, but a pretty weird experience again, having her first birthday in a hospital with the big scar on her head from brain surgery and being pumped full of drugs. So, so we were there. Um, it was about this time that Lily met kind of actually it was one of the first people we met in the hospital um our friend Hannah and her daughter Madison was in there who was a couple of years older than than Lily Jean but that was kind of the first kids that or the kid that Lily connected with um so they always held a special place in our hearts um Madison's also passed away uh she passed away um that summer and uh we went to her funeral and I was honored to sing a few songs there. Um, and that was really tough because it was kind of the first close experience with, um, you know, a, a kid with cancer passing away, which ultimately would be the fate for Lily Jean. Um, so they've always been really close to us. We still keep in touch over Facebook. And um, yeah, it's one of those shitty things to have in common that keeps you kind of um, bonding for life. And, yeah. So we had her first birthday there. And then uh, we did get to go home for Christmas because her birthday was December 5th, as I said. We got to go home for Christmas because um, she was doing pretty well. and But that it was just for Christmas so that we could be home. And then a couple of days after, we were back to uh, continue the chemotherapy treatment. And um, yeah, kind of for there, it was from there. It was living in the hospital for... We ended up being a better part of six months, probably. Um, as I said, one of us would stay at the hospital with Lily. One of us would go to the hotel or Ronald McDonald House um, and try and get a good night's sleep there because the as great as the hospital is, you can not do much for sleeping arrangements for parents. Um, it's great. You get to stay in the same room as your kid, but it's... Uh, just, um, you know, it's a cot that they wheel in, single mattress, if you can even call it a mattress, really. And uh, so you're sleeping right beside your kid um, who's hooked up to an IV pole that's feeding the chemotherapy through or just um, other fluids. And for some reason, it seemed like this thing had to beep very loudly every, like, 20 to 30 minutes all throughout the night. Or if it was low battery, then it would really go off and seem to have some reason to make noise anytime that you fell asleep. And uh, obviously the nurses had to come in every hour or two to check um, vitals and to make sure things were going okay. And So you're waking up with that most of the time. Um, they were great. I mean, they do their best to come in quietly and obviously try and not wake the kid up if the kid's sleeping, not wake the parents up if they're sleeping. And uh, But most of the time you're you're getting up or if they're checking her stats, she's waking up and then you have to calm her down and get her back to sleep. And so the, the nights there were pretty rough. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was just kind of our life and it's what we knew. It's what we had to make work for, for those six months. Um, another thing I remember was, uh, killing time by going to like, they had little kitchenettes on each floor. So I would go there and still to this day, if I have toast with butter and jam, it takes me right back there like this. Because I would probably have like five or six pieces of toast with butter and jam every day that I was there. And I would just walk there, make it, kill some time, eat it, come back. Lily's still sleeping or getting her tests done. Um, and yeah, that was life. It was, uh, it was tough. And I mean, the days... You go to get a good night's sleep. Half the time, you're probably not sleeping much anyways. I know Lily's mom really struggled with that. and um, 
yeah, it was uh, it was hard to be away, and then it was important to be away to keep your sanity. Um, but uh, yeah, six months we went through that. She was doing her chemotherapy mostly then, um, trying to see what uh, what could be done um, to shrink this thing or at least stop it from growing to see how much time we really had. And um, she would get the chemo. She actually had to have tubes put in her chest and so these tubes would come right out of her skin and then they would hook them up and put the IV in there uh and it made it hard because she couldn't she couldn't like go into the bath or anything unless you wrapped her up in saran wrap like she was leftovers or something because they couldn't get wet and you had to clean them all the time um yeah so she got her chemo through those um next kind of uh big moment we met um Jaden and uh, Jamie. Well, I had met Jamie already, um, but Jaden and Lily hadn't met. They met on anti-bullying day, which my wife tells me was February 27th. Um, she helped me put together this timeline here. So thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, I've got a few good pictures of those I'll put up. Um, we just kind of hung out. They got their pink shirts and uh, they both had their bald heads, um, and they got to hang out quite a bit. I mean, Jamie and I were, were getting pretty serious, and um, people somehow, you know, thought, wow, how did you get two kids with cancer when we were hanging out, and they were both bald, and we explained that this was mine, and that was hers, but um, yeah, you get some pretty funny looks walking around with two bald girls, um, but they were cute as hell, as you can see from the pictures, so... Um, I, uh, it was around, around May, we got some, we had another scan. So we were doing scans every, uh, at least a couple months, I'm sure, to see what was going on. And this scan showed that it had slowed down, um, significantly in growth. So it wasn't, didn't seem to be growing anymore, which was a good sign. Um, but they didn't know how to shrink it and get rid of it. Um, knowing that it would start growing again. So it was good news, but as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, it was always um, this hope that you would create in yourself, whereas, you know, from the beginning, it was always such a negative outcome that was um, ultimately going to happen. But then you hear some of this news and you start getting confused and you're like, okay, so stopped growing now so it could start shrinking it could be gone and she could be okay but um it was never really the case and it was this uh I always say it, it was a false hope that I was creating in my own head um which I think I kind of needed to do to get by and uh to keep you know really trying to enjoy this time I had with Lily and help her experience what we could in the world um so at this time, we kind of did start moving a bit more towards outpatient, meaning we didn't have to stay at the hospital as much or as long. Um, we could bring the chemotherapy home with us and start giving it to her ourselves and, uh, and then just go in maybe once a week for checkups and, and uh, to get the drugs that we needed to give to her. Um, and she uh, had a hard time taking these. It was... Um, I would describe it as if you melted down anything metal and then tried to feed it to a child and <laughs> tell them they had to take it every day. And so that was the chemo. But then the drugs to to stop the nausea and all this were just as bad tasting. And um, she had a really hard time keeping this stuff down. We would have to put her in the bathtub and try and get it in her um, so that she wouldn't throw it up. And then half the time she was throwing it up. So then you'd have to wait and try and give it to her again until she could actually keep it down. Um, so it was just a, a constant battle and, uh, just like, yeah, it's so disheartening to see this kid is probably has no idea why she has to take this medicine and, and she knows it's going to make her throw up and we still keep forcing it down her throat. Um, so yeah, that was a really hard part of it. Uh, trying to trying to get her to take these meds and trying to get them to stay in her stomach to help do what they're supposed to do. 
which is make her not sick half the time. But And I think it was the one that was for anti-nausea was the one that was making her puke instantly. And um, yeah, it was tough. So um, but we were out of the hospital a bit. So we were getting to do a little bit here and there with her. Um, and um, we had her second birthday. At our place, we did a Curious George theme, as she called him Monkey George. She used to watch the movie over and over, and uh, it had the soundtrack by Jack Johnson, and that's why um, the song Upside Down is one of my favorites to play it at my gigs, and Jaden did a dance routine to it as well. That was really special. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we did try to do normal life things, lots of, you know, picnics and whatever, and just hanging out um, when she was feeling up for it. And uh, then a few months later, the next scan was not good news, um, and it showed that that the tumor was growing again. Um, and uh, it, they weren't sure really what to do because um, it meant this chemo wasn't working as well as they had hoped it would. Um, and there really wasn't many other options. So we decided to keep trying some of the chemo or I think they changed up the regiment a bit uh, or order that they would give the drugs in to hope maybe something different would happen. So we did keep trying that for a little while. Um, and this is, I think, kind of where the dancing in the rain list came in. So it was Lily's mom's idea um, instead of a bucket list to, uh, to call it dancing in the rain. And we put together a list of uh, stuff that we would like Lily to experience um, knowing that um, the end was going to be coming uh, way sooner than should ever be expected. But we um, started putting some really big things, some small things, like just going to the water slides, or going to the movies, um, having a first day at school, uh, going on trips, you know, Disneyland, things like that. And so we put this out there and... Um, had a, had a few really big sponsors um, to help with some of these wishes, um, you know, and some littler ones who just said, yeah, we'll send you to the water slides, no problem, here's some passes, go have fun, which is great because neither of us were really um, working much. And uh, so we got to start doing some of these things. In February, we went down to Disneyland because um, Lily, like all little girls, was in love with um, princesses. And so we went to Disneyland, had a blast down there. She, uh, she did pretty well. Um, she obviously would get pretty tired. So, uh, it was tough to do too, too much with her, but, um, you could tell by some of these pictures, she loved seeing all the princesses and, um, it was worth it just for that. Like we had the princess tea where they all came around and said hi to her. And, uh, yeah, the whole trip, that was probably her highlight and, and ours too, just getting to see her that happy to meet these princesses for real um so so that was great that was one of the biggest ones we did um and then it was kind of time after that when we got back and we ended up it was time to stop treatment as we knew the the next scan was bad as well and um so it was uh yeah it was really time to kick it into overdrive and do everything we possibly could with this kid, knowing that, um, that her time was very limited. Um, they took her tubes out and there's a really funny video. I love, um, she getting in the bath cause she couldn't really have a bath before, as I said. And, uh, she's saying no tubes, no tubes. Cause she's in there splashing around and she doesn't have to worry about getting these tubes wet. Um, so those came out, so we were able to take her to the water slide. She could go swimming in the lakes and everything. And um, we, uh, we had our first day of school, um, thanks to Chris Weiger at Kent Elementary, the elementary school that I went to. Uh, we took her into kindergarten, and that was a really cool day, one we'll never forget. 
Um, so thanks Chris for, for setting us up with that. And she loved it being around all the kids and, and, uh, just playing. And I'm sure she felt a bit more normal to be in a situation like that without all the doctors and, and nurses around as well as other kids. (laughs) So that was pretty cool. Um, we, uh, we then got to go to Hawaii, um, in April. And so in Hawaii, we went to the Disney resort. So again, she got to see a bunch of the characters and there's these awesome pools there. Um, incredible resort if you ever get a chance to go. Um, so we did that. She, uh, yeah, we went to like a luau and stuff and Lilo and Stitch was one of her favorite, favorite movies. So we got to meet them and, um, yeah, that was, that was the last big trip that we got to do. Uh, we also went on a train ride to Banff, which was really cool. Actually, the air conditioning in our sleeping car wasn't working, so it was really hot because I think that would have been maybe June or July, and it was really heating up. Um, and then the last trip we took was a trip to Tofino on the island. Um, so Tofino's always had a really special place in uh in my heart and eventually that's where we spread her ashes uh we took a boat out um into the ocean uh, and uh and we did that um yeah it was it was a tough time we had a lot of good good memories with her obviously um but every time one of these trips was coming to an end and um it's just so emotional, you know, thinking it could be her last trip or the last really fun thing we get to do together. And, uh, I kind of wrote a song about that. And the vacation song, one of the tunes I wrote, um, is all about the emotions of or the first verse anyways, about vacations coming to an end and, and why I get so emotional. And I think this has a big, uh, big part to do with that. Um, she loved, uh, music class was another thing we got to do, uh, towards the end of her life. She would go just to learn rhythms and little dancing and everything. Um, We did that in Harrison with our friend uh, Jen. And she also did ballet. Um, She got to do ballet class. That was another thing on the list. She did that for a few weeks as well. Um, And uh, we made sure she got... So this was all kind of happening from, as I said, well, Hawaii was April. And so May, June, July, August, we kind of fired off a lot of stuff here. Um, And uh, so we did another Halloween um, in the summer. So we just kind of mentioned to people on her street with uh, her mom in Abbotsford. And then um, we mentioned to people at my mom's place in Chilliwack around her complex where we went out that we were going to do this. And everyone was so awesome. Everybody dressed up and... And uh, so we took her trick-or-treating again. Um, we had a two-and-a-half-year birthday party because we knew she wasn't going to make it to three years old. And, um, and then in August, we had Christmas for her, which was... <clears throat> yeah, it was really special. Um, the uh, So again, Lily's mom and I weren't together. So she had two Christmases in August <laughs> um, and the one in Chilliwack with us, uh, the Chilliwack chiefs brought over a truckload of snow from the arena and shoveled it into our backyard. Um, and uh, yeah, that's one of my favorite memories too. Excuse me. <clears throat> so she woke up and had presents and had a yard full of snow in in the middle of August, and then we went to uh, my aunt's clubhouse and had a Christmas party, and there was carolers who came in to sing Christmas carols and more presents, and our good friend Dennis uh, showed up in the Santa Claus outfit um, to uh, to play Santa Claus, um, but by this time she was getting very tired and, and, uh, and really weak, <clears throat> so she didn't last too long at the party, but... Um, she had a great time. I know that. Um, and, uh, after that, it was, um, not too long. Uh, Chelsea had her on the day that we went into Canuck place and I was, I was golfing. I was, um, 
at the Falls Golf Course, and and I got a phone call from from Chelsea, and she said, you know, I think you need to come here. She was in Abbotsford, so so I took off, and and Lily was in really bad shape. She was uh, she was kind of, you know, she would have little little seizures here and there, and um, and she was in and out of consciousness, and so we knew it was time. Um, we uh, we called who we needed to call, and they said it would be a good idea to head out to Canuck Place in Vancouver, which is the um, children's hospice, where we did, we spent a few days before this to um, just to kind of see it and, and, and get used to it, for lack of a better term, before we uh, had to go in there. Um, so, so we went to Canuck Place at the end of August, and, um, and uh, that's where we spent Lily's last days. Uh, we started getting a lot of really, um, really nice messages from people uh, around, well, around the country and even some around the world of people dancing in the rain um, for Lily. And the Canuck Place staff was awesome. They were doing everything they could to help kind of give us whatever we needed or help get us food when we needed to, um, uh, to try and help prepare us for, you know, how things would likely play out over the next couple of days. And, uh, Lily was mostly just sleeping. Um, when she would wake up, she would ask to watch, uh, the Minions movie mostly and, and ask for some cookies. Um, she loved these ginger snap cookies that, that uh, her grandma Eddie would make her. Um, and then it was very early the morning of September 6th that uh, Lily's mom kind of woke me up and and Lily was um, having a really hard time breathing. I think it was kind of that what we knew was kind of coming were these um, apneas where she would stop breathing for quite a while and, and uh, then have a big gasp of air. And it was the freakiest thing every time. And you knew it was coming when she would not breathe for, um, <laughs> and I should have said something before. Um, a lot of this will be, I'm sure, quite disturbing and, and hard to hear. I think it's a bit of therapy for me, so I'm going to keep going with it. And uh, yeah, hopefully it helps you guys realize kind of what a lot of families have to go through that... Um, that really uh, changes the dynamic of a person and a family and um, and hopefully helps you guys maybe want to help and donate. Uh, I'll get into a bit more of that later. So Lily was having these apneas where she wouldn't breathe and then it would scare the shit out of you and she would take this huge breath. And, um, and then it was that whole day just waiting for that big breath not to come. Um, so that was, that was tough. And we spent that day letting her know that we loved her and that it was okay that she could pass on. Um, because the doctor said, you know, sometimes they need to hear that and know that you're okay. And I think it's kind of a way of them telling you to trick yourself into being okay with it. But, um, and it was, uh, not till later that afternoon, um, that she passed away and Chelsea was holding her and I was playing my guitar and singing. Um, I was mostly singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow or Hallelujah, a couple of the songs I really liked to play for her. And, um, and she passed away and, uh, the, again, the Canuck Place staff was very respectful and, and, um, we had our time with her and then they said you know if you guys want to go um go upstairs like there was a room there for us that we didn't really spend time in because we were with lily the whole time um and they said they'll take care of of getting her ready and they did that and they put this uh beautiful dress on her and um and then i they said you know a lot of the dads or the parents want 
like to carry their child out. Uh, and so I did that and carried her out and she was taken away. And, um, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was that. And, and so that was kind of the end of her story. Um, she was, uh, yeah, not quite three years old, um, taken far too soon, um, along with, you know, some friends that we made there, um, as I mentioned, Madison and another, um, young, young boy we became close with, uh, Shawnee and his mom, Tina, um, they were always great and they got to hang out a few times, but then, um, it, this was after Lily passed, Sean passed away and, uh, a couple other of her, of, of girls I remember, older girls who really, you know, looked out for Lily or just had a few, I think it was even just a couple of days that they, um, were in her life, but I remembered Cecilia and Alyssa who also passed away. Um, and, uh, it's, it's been a tough thing <clears throat> since <laughs> to, uh, to get through. Um, so that was 2013. Um, and, uh, you know, we celebrate her birthdays and, and, uh, the day she passed away, we try and do something special. Um, and yeah, it was still doesn't seem uh, fair or right. And, uh, I wanted to say thank you to some people. Maybe that'll help me <clears throat> cheer up here a bit or something. <laughs> So we, um, firstly, as I mentioned a ton of times, the Canuck Place staff and the BC Children's Hospital for doing everything they could do um, and helping us along. They're amazing places and amazing people that work there. Um, and uh, the communities that came together, there were a lot of really big fundraisers done for Lily Jean um, to help us spend as much time as we could with her and not worry about, um, finding the money for it or, um, wondering, you know, if we could stay there, if we had to go home, if somebody had to go to work, uh, and also to help send us on these trips with her so that she could experience some of what this world has to offer. Um, so thank you to everybody who, who put on those fundraisers, this guitar is from one of them that happened in Edmonton. Um, they a bunch of bands got together and played and they got everybody to sign this guitar and, and, uh, Brittany brought it out for me, one of the sisters who put on the fundraiser. Um, and, uh, and there was, there was a bunch of other ones, lots in Chilliwack and Abbotsford and our friend Becca up in Fort McMurray. Um, there was, there was a ton of people. So thank you all. I won't mention you all by name, but thank you guys. And, um, and again, those families we met through the hospital who kind of helped us, uh, figure out what the hell was going on, um, especially when we first checked in. Um, it was Cecilia and her mom were some of the first people who kind of helped us, and the Kettlewells. Um, I remember them very well as well. So, because it was a scary thing to be so young in there with with uh, with your baby. Um, yeah. Lastly, I wanted to talk about um, is is the, you know, fundraising aspect of this all and helping fund research, um, to, uh, find different treatments or, I mean, help maybe a cure. <laughs> um, and, uh, so again, my wife helped me look up a few stats and cause I knew it was an unbelievably low percentage of the money raised for cancer research that goes towards pediatric ca cancer. Um, and so the stat we found was that 5% of all cancer research funding goes towards pediatric cancers. And obviously that's not a very big number. Um, and we would like to see that change. And um, so next time, if you are donating or attending a fundraiser or uh, wondering where you should put your money towards, um, I think you should think about these kids, uh, these teenagers who, um, who, don't get an opportunity to grow up and uh 
I've always struggled with this, but um, I don't think it's insensitive. And I think uh, if you ask a lot of these people, if um, uh, and adults get breast cancer or prostate cancer and, and uh, you know, but these kids don't even get that chance to grow up and have those experiences before these type of cancers. Um, and if, if you ask someone with breast cancer, would you rather have breast cancer at 40 or brain cancer at five? Um, it's, I think it would be a pretty easy answer for most people. And I think that should <laughs> maybe push us towards funding more research for these kids so that they stand a chance, um, to live a little bit of their lives. And, uh, something else we saw that was, um, 250, 250 kids, uh, die every day from cancer around the world. Um, and, uh, as I said, that was my big reason for doing this to keep Lily's story alive, fill in some of my friends on, you know, the details if they wanted them or, uh, maybe why I am the way I am sometimes. Um, and to raise awareness for, pediatric cancer it's um you don't really notice it until you or someone you're close to is is going through it um I never thought of it before Lily got diagnosed and then everywhere I looked I saw it or heard about it and it just surrounds you um and consumes your life and uh and you feel like there's something that could be done or should be done um and we're trying uh, to stay involved, and I'm very happy to support, especially Children's Hospital in Canuck Place. I've done numerous uh, fundraisers, whether I'm singing or helping out at them. Um, my sister Carolyn does this amazing race around Chilliwack, um, and I've started a golf tournament in Chilliwack as well, the Love for Lily Golf Tournament. Um, and uh, Lily's mom organizes a big team every year for the child run in Vancouver. So those are a couple things if you guys are looking on how you could help um, support uh, pediatric cancer research or just the hospitals or Canuck Place. Um, there's lots of opportunities out there. Uh, yeah, I think I kind of got through this. Um, I, uh, I appreciate those of you who did, who did listen. Um, and if you're if you're watching, I hope you enjoyed all the videos and the pictures of of Lily. Um, she was a beautiful little girl, and um, she was taken far too soon. And um, I uh, I urge you guys to help when you can, um, and really think specifically about putting some of that money towards pediatric cancer research um, when you're donating. Um, split it down the middle. Um, you can give half you know, just to the Canadian Cancer Society. Um, and then, but there are ways to specifically donate towards pediatric cancer research, whether it's through Children's Hospital um, or the Cancer Society. So please look into that um, for Lily Jean, for all these other kids who we got close to who have passed away um, and for all the parents who've, who've had to deal with this. And I hope you guys are all doing okay. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out if you ever want to, chat and yeah fuck cancer I can't fight this feeling I won't stop this bleeding won't you come now come save me somehow I'm stuck in this rat race I'm a silent disgrace I'm somewhere I can say I know you'll find me someday And it's where I hide It's where I Thank you.
Are we in Tofino? Yeah. Can you say it? Say we're in Tofino. In Tofino. 